After the holidays, they gave Pat another chance. So me, Charlie, and Pat, we started again with Sonny Riccobini. Now we had two teams, Salvi and his guys, and Chick and his. They gave out day shifts and night shifts. We worked the day shift and they worked the night shift. Another incident came up and Pat started talking treason again. Me and Charlie, we go back to Chick. We don't want to be with this fuck no more. We told him about the things he said about Scarfo and Chucky, Salvi and Lawrence. It just wasn't fucking right. Now, when we made the beef to Chick, we were in fear of our fucking lives. We didn't know what the fuck Pat was saying behind our backs. We know this fuck don't want to kill nobody. He didn't want to kill Sonny. He was always finding excuses and this was making us look bad. But it came to a point where I think they understood. Chick knew we were serious. We didn't want no parts of this fucking guy. But, man, you gotta become a fucking stroker in this business. You gotta know how to stroke. Because these motherfuckers, they look for every blink of the fucking eye. I'll never forget what happened next. It was Johnny Cupcakes, Johnny Malili's daughter. She was getting married. Everybody was there. in and I sit with Tommy Del Giorno. Pat's in the back. He's sitting with Charlie and a couple of other guys with their wives. I stop and I talk to Tommy and Faffy for a while. Pat comes over to the table and he says to me, what the fuck, Nick? When are you going to come over and sit with us? I'll be right over. He was pretty bugged. So, I go to the table. After a while, Chucky calls me over. He says he wants to see me upstairs in the bathroom. He says he wants to know what's going on with this guy, Pat. So I tell him. The way Pat talks about him, Nikki, Philip, his brother Lawrence, Selfie, Chucky just listens. I says to him, we can't be around this guy no more. Nothing's getting done. It's... It's all fucking nonsense. You gotta remember, we were spending hours and hours, days and weeks, stalking Sonny. There were a lot of times we could have had him, but there was always a fucking story. So, Chucky, he seemed to be satisfied. See, in this business, You always need to, guys. You just can't beef on a guy. You gotta have proof. Charlie was my proof. Everything I said, he confirmed. 
Charlie had had enough of this fuck. Enough. So, when we come downstairs, we go over to the bar. The bartender asks Chucky, what does he want? And Chucky says, give me a fucking 38. In other words, he wants to blast Pat right fucking there. About a week later, Caramondi and Ianich were summoned to a meeting with Chucky Merlino and Chicky Changalini at Changalini's clubhouse at 9th and Catherine. When they arrived, Changalini was huddled in a corner with Ronald Cuddles DiCaprio, another mob associate. Merlino called Caramondi and Ianich over and told them, Pat's gotta go. I want you to use this kid over here. He said, nodding towards DiCaprio. Earlier that year, DiCaprio had been linked to the murder of Robert Hornickel, a low-level drug dealer whose body was found in the trunk of his car. Hornickel had been shot and strangled. DiCaprio who would later be convicted of racketeering charges that included the Hornickel murder, was one of Changolini's associates, and the Spirito contract was a chance for him to move up within the organization. Ironically, Caramondi and Charlie White in each were in much the same position. They still had not done any work, despite nearly a year of trying. Now, they were going to turn their guns in another direction. Pascal Pat the Cat Spirito would be a much easier target. So, now the three of us go outside and I ask this Cuddles guy for his phone number. I tell him we'll be in touch with him as soon as we devise a plan. Me and Charlie are talking. We decide the best way to get this guy is to tell him we got a shot at Sonny. We found out Sonny used to go to this place up at 66th in Haverford that was owned by a guy who owed Sonny money. We planned to tell Pat that Sonny goes up there on Friday nights. Now, this is on a Tuesday. The next night, me and Charlie, we drive to this place. We decide it's too fucking far. We'd have to drive all the way up there, blast the fuck, then drive all the way back but as we're driving back we devise another plan we're gonna tell him we're going up there just to stake it out no guns just to see if sunny goes up there but on route to going there we picked a spot downtown on 11th street between mifflin and moore It's pretty fucking dead there. It's near the church. Near St. Maria Goretti's church. Pat would pick me up first at my apartment, then drive down to Broad to pick up Charlie on Wolf. Then, as we're driving, Charlie would pretend like he forgot his money. He would ask me if I had any. I'd say, yeah. How much do you want? He'd say he had to give a guy 200. At this point, he would tell Pat to pull over. It would be right on the corner. I'd be in the front of the car. Charlie would be in the back. He would have his gun hidden under his sports coat, over his arm. 
I would have a little 25 automatic in my back pocket. We tried for months to kill this guy. And for a while, that's all we fucking talked about. We'd get sick whenever we'd see him. Wanna throw the fuck up? Then on Thursday, Pat takes me into Craving's Luncheonette, another place where we used to hang out at, around 12.30, 1 o'clock. He's got me in the booth for three fucking hours. See, he had bad vibes. He knew there was something wrong. He knew he was in trouble. He was waiting to go to jail. He had gotten eight years in the racketeering case and he was out on appeal. For three hours, he was looking into my eyes and telling me, you know you're my best friend, right? I mean, I fucking like you more than Charlie. I'm gonna get you down someday. You're on the verge of getting fucking made. It's only a matter of time. We just gotta get this fucking sunny, you know? Once we take him the fuck out, it's a fucking done deal for you. Just remember that. I'm going... Yeah, yeah. I know. I I know, Pat. Now, Pat's trying to work my head. He's trying to look for some kind of reaction. He says to me, you know, if you called me at four o'clock in the fucking morning to meet you somewhere, I'd meet you. That's how much I trust you. If I don't trust you, I can't trust nobody. I knew this guy had bad vibes. So I says, are you fucking crazy? I don't want to hear this shit. You're my best fucking friend, you know? Without you... Without you, I wouldn't fucking be here. So quit it with this shit. Just quit it. He's got me drinking coffee for hours. Making me tell him... How much I love him and... This shit is already set up to kill him the next night. I says to him, Pat, what are you talking about? What are you talking like this for? I would do anything for you, man. Like I said, I would not be here if it weren't for you, buddy. I mean, my fucking life is yours, Christ. I fucking love you like a fucking brother. I love you, man. Pat's burrito spent the last day of his life in about the same way he had been spending most of his time that previous year. Drinking at the bar in Mara's restaurant on Passyonk Avenue and whining about the Sonny Rigabini contract. Spirito got to Mara's a little afternoon on Friday, April 29th, 1983. Karamandi and Ianich found him there a short time later. All fucking day, he's saying. I don't think this guy's gonna show. 
I mean, it's not like this is a spot that he's always at, you know? This, this kind of feels like a, a we'll hope and see, you know? Kind of random. All this fucking driving over there. I don't think he's gonna fucking be there. What the fuck? We'll go see. And if not, we'll have dinner up there. What's the big fucking deal? But he's going on. I already know he's not gonna be there. You know, Sonny's not gonna show up. He won't show up. This is just gonna be another fucking wasted trip. He's not gonna be there. He finally agrees. Me and Charlie, we go home about three, four o'clock. Pat's still at Mara's. Now, Pat starts calling me. He says, why don't we just go early? I mean, why do we gotta go so late? Six fucking times he must have called me. Each time I call Charlie, Charlie tells me to give him the shit. See, we can't go early because this cuddles is not gonna be there till nine o'clock. Finally, nine o'clock, quarter after fucking nine, Pat picks me up. He's moaning. He's fucking beefing. I says to him, Pat, what's the difference, man? It's a fucking night out. We'll get something to eat. We'll get some drinks. We'll have a good time. We get to Charlie's house. He blows the horn. Here comes Charlie. With his coat over his arm. Charlie gets in the back seat. Pat had a 78 Cadillac. Two door. Gray. All of a sudden, Charlie says, Motherfucker. <sighs> I forgot my fucking money. Nick, you got any money on you? Yeah, Charlie. How much you need? 200. I gotta give a guy 200. So, I reach in my pocket. I pull out the money. I give it to him in the back seat, making it look real. Now, we're between Mifflin and McKeon. All of a sudden, a fucking car is trying to park. It must have taken him three or four minutes. Cars are backed up behind us. In fact, they start blowing their fucking horns. We're a little bugged, you know? We finally get moving and get to 11th and Mifflin, right at the stop sign. Pat says, We're at. Charlie says, Just pull over, Pat. So, Pat pulls over to the northeast corner on 11th Street at Mifflin. There's a fire plug there. Now, I don't know what to do here. There are these cars going by. I got my hand on the door and I am hesitating. I wanna turn around. I wanna turn around to see what Charlie wants to do. I'm fucking hesitating. All of a sudden. Looking at him, his head jerks to the right and just drops down. Then, again, a couple of seconds later, Charlie put two in his fucking head. No sense me taking my fucking gun out. It's too late. I jump out of the car, but Pat's got the car in drive and it's starting to roll. Charlie's in the back seat. 
He's a burly fucking guy. He's having trouble getting out. I'm pulling him. We know everybody heard it, these fucking shots. I get him out. The car rolls about five or six feet and bangs into a car parked in front of it. We run down Mifflin. This cuddles, he pulls out. His lights are on. We jump in the fucking car, me in the front seat and Charlie in the back. We're wiping the guns off with our handkerchiefs. We're both pretty fucking nervous. It's our first time, you know? I'm screaming at Cuddles. Go through the fucking stop signs! Shut off the goddamn lights so nobody can see your license tags! Go! He's got his own car. We get to 9th and Mifflin. I throw my gun out between 8th and 9th on Mifflin. Charlie throws his gun out. We go down 7th Street near Moore and jump out of the fucking car. Charlie goes his way. I go mine. I say to him, Look, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Charlie was gonna have an alibi with a girl. He was gonna take her to a motel. I would go around the neighborhood, stare around past the Young Avenue. So, I go take a shower. I use somebody's house. I change my clothes. I put on jeans because I was dressed up. I'm waiting. I figure the cops are gonna come around. I go to this bar on 12th and Morris. I'm sitting there and I'm drinking. All of a sudden, this big Mike who used to run the bar he comes around. You hear what happened? They whacked Pat. Get the fuck out of here. Where at? 11th and Mifflin. Two fucking guys. They don't know who. All of a sudden, they break in with it on the 11 o'clock news while Mike's talking to me on the fucking TV. When he became boss in the spring of 1981, little Nikki made it known to Harry the Hunchback Riccobini, a one-time underworld ally, that he expected a non-negotiable set percentage of his monthly cash intake to be collected as part of Scarfo's aggressive underworld street tax. Despite the killings of John Calabres and Stevie Boris and the violent beating of Frank Frankie Flowers de Alfonso, all of whom had balked at paying Scarfo's street tax, Riccobini, the seasoned old school mob vet, scoffed at Scarfo's demand. Over the years, Riccobini had built up a strong power base. He surrounded himself with a loyal, well stocked crew of thugs, thieves, and fellow racketeers who answered to him and only him. As if a street war with Harry Riccobini in South Philadelphia wasn't enough. Nicky Scarfo and Philip Leonetti soon became saddled with a new problem from an old foe in Atlantic City. Now, right around the time we started beefing with Harry, Frank Grace gets word to us through Bobby Lumio that he needs to see me and my uncle. Frank Grace was a bartender who we knew. We made him president of Local 54, which was the biggest union in Atlantic City, representing the hotel and restaurant workers in the casinos. At the time, they had like 15,000 people in the union. They were strong, but we 
made them even stronger. Babi Lumio was a made guy whom my uncle put in a powerful position at Local 54. He was the secretary treasurer and was on the executive board. He also lived in one of our apartments on Georgia Avenue. At the time, Bobby was dying. He had real bad cancer. The doctors, they had only given him a few months to live. Bobby tells me one day, you gotta get with Percy. Meaning Frank Grace, he's got a problem with Joe Salerno. Joe Salerno? The plumber? They got him in the witness protection program. How's he making trouble for Frank? I'm thinking, maybe his meds got him all loopy. Because Joe Salerno ain't around no more. And I don't think he plans on coming back. He knows we'd kill him. If he did. So, Bobby's lying there in the bed and he says, you gotta get with Percy. So, the next day I send for Frank Grace and I have him meet me down in Margate, near a place I had on Adams Avenue. When he gets there, I tell him what Bobby had told me. He says to me, It's true, Philip. Joe Salerno is going to testify against me at a hearing with the state. They're trying to get me out of Local 54. They're saying, I am with you and your uncle. Joe Salerno is their main witness. I tell Frank I'll talk to my uncle and we'll work things out. Now this is bad. We made a lot of fucking money from Local 54. We were getting 50, 60, sometimes a hundred grand a month. All of it. Cash. If Frank Grace gets bumped out, it's gonna be a problem for our family. A big fucking problem. The business-as-usual atmosphere of Atlantic City casinos belies the crucial power struggle which is underway there. While the state doesn't have the authority to exclude any labor unions from the casino industry, under the Casino Control Act, a union whose leaders do not meet the strict character requirements set for casino employees can be prevented from collecting union dues or managing employee pension funds, something which could effectively put a union out of business. And it is precisely this kind of action Local 54 is trying to forestall. 54. The division wants Local 54 and union leader Gerace barred from the casino industry. The commission... I knew my uncle was going to go nuts when he found out about this. Winning the Falcone murder trial wasn't enough for him. He wanted to kill Joe Salerno for testifying against us, but we couldn't get to him. He was in the witness protection program. Every time we were around the Narducci brothers, Frank and Philip, my uncle would ask them, you guys seen Salerno around? Because Joe Salerno's family lives right near where the Narducci's live. When Frank or Philip would say no, my uncle would go into a tirade about Joe Salerno calling him a no-good rat motherfucker or calling him a cocksucking rat and he would tell them let me tell you something if that motherless fuck ever shows his face it's this and he'd make the sign of the gun I don't give a fuck who he's with he could be with the fucking Pope and it's this and make the sign of the gun again 
So, the next morning when I pick up my uncle, I tell him about my conversation with Bobby Lomillo and Frank Grace. He went berserk about Joe Salerno. This fuck. This motherless fuck. This motherfucker wants to keep trying to hurt us. Oh yeah? All right. We're gonna fucking hurt him. He was irate. One, because he was gonna testify against us. Again. And two, this time, it could cost us a lot of money. My uncle says to me, today when we go see Bobby, I want him to get to the fucking bottom of this. We were on our way to Philadelphia to see Bobby Simone. He was representing my uncle on his appeal of the federal gun charge. The whole ride up, we're not talking. We never talked in the car or even near the car. But every 10 minutes or so, my uncle would say, this motherfucker, motherless fuck, fucking cocksucker, motherfucker, motherfucking motherfucker, or mutter something to himself about Joe Salerno. I'm riding next to him and he's talking to himself like a crazy person. So, we get to Bobby's office and he tells my uncle if he doesn't win the appeal on the gun case, he's looking at two years in prison and he'd have to do about 18 months. It was almost like my uncle didn't hear a word Bobby said. He says to Bobby, Look, Bob, I'm not worried about the gun case. If I gotta do the two years, I'll do the two years. I need you to look into this thing for me. And he tells him, about the thing with Joe Salerno and Frank Grace. Bobby says, okay, Nick. And he starts talking about the gun case again. My uncle waves him off and says, Bob, we need to focus on this thing with Joe Salerno. We can worry about the gun case later. Bobby tells us to give him a few days to find out what's going on. So, about a week later, Bobby Simone comes down to see us. We take a walk up to the boardwalk. He tells us that Joe Salerno is scheduled to testify before the state. That if things go bad, Frank Grace is going to be removed as president of Local 54. And that there could be an indictment for labor racketeering charges. My uncle looks at me, shakes his head and says, these fucking rats, these motherfucking fucking rats. We gotta do something here. We can't just sit back and fucking watch. We gotta take action. I didn't know what to say. What could I say? Joe Salerno was in the Witness Protection Program. It's not like he was in Atlantic City or South Philadelphia 
and we could kill him. We had no idea where he was. A week later, under the protection of the United States Marshal Service, Joe Salerno would testify before the New Jersey State Casino Control Commission about Local 54 and its connections to Nikki Scarfo, Philip Leonetti, and the mob. His testimony touched on his relationship with Scarfo, Leonetti, the Merlino brothers, and mob killer Nicholas Nick the Blade Virgilio in the late 1970s, and each of their relationships with the Union. He then went into detail once again about the night Philip Leonetti murdered Vincent Falcone. Salerno's testimony included a story about an incident in which Nicky Scarfo lost his temper at Bobby Lomillo, a high-ranking official of Local 54, after Lomillo made a joke that Scarfo did not find funny. According to Salerno's testimony, Scarfo said to Lomillo, Let me tell you something. I got you your fucking job. And I got that other big fat jerk off downstairs his fucking job. And don't you ever fucking forget it. The Casino Control Commission heard opening arguments today from Local 54 and the state's Division of Gaming Enforcement. The state is fighting the union's attempt to represent casino workers in Atlantic City. Brenda Flanagan reports. The Division of Gaming Enforcement opposes registration of the union based on alleged ties between Local 54 President Frank Gerace and reputed Philadelphia mob boss Nicodemo Little Nicky Scarfo. The DGE's case also focuses on three other union employees, citing their prior criminal records. Today, the DGE told the Casino Control Commission it would prove the union's alleged organized crime connections. You will hear testimony that Nicky Scarfo has confided that he helped place Frank Gerace and Robert Lumio into their positions of power in Local 54. You will hear testimony about how Frank Gerace helped bail out Nicky Scarfo, Phil Leonetti, and Larry Merlino after they had been charged with the murder of Vincent Falcone in 1979. Sturgis said the DGE plans to re-subpoena Scarfo to testify before the commission. Sturgis also alleged Gerace took an illegal payment from a North Jersey man who was appealing a conviction on labor racketeering. But union attorney Bernard Katz strongly disagreed. He characterized the Gerace Scarfo relationship as a coincidence, a family acquaintance. That any innuendo, any slander, any defamation attempting to use that type of relationship, the familial, ethnic, and geographic coincidences that exist are just simply and purely an outrage. In addition, Katz repeated his claim that state agencies have no constitutional right to interfere with the operations of a federally regulated union. Subcommittee today opened hearings on the influence of organized crime on the hotel and restaurant employees union. The center of today's inquiry was Atlantic City's controversial Local 54. Kevin Flanagan reports from Washington. The subcommittee had a long involvement tracing corruption in major labor unions. Today's testimony characterized the hotel workers' leadership in Atlantic City as among the most corrupt in the United States. According to the staff investigator, certain officials of the hotel workers' union have been associated with major organized crime figures. A number of the witnesses appearing before the committee were law enforcement officials who told how organized crime could move into the leadership of labor unions. That is that they are willing to use coercive measures. They, they're more than happy to use violence. They will burn your business. They will blow up your car, your car, blow up your home, they will kill you, they will threaten your family. And uh, that gives them quite a competitive edge. While testimony given emphasized that almost all unions in New Jersey exist to serve their members, when there is a potential for great profit, organized crime has moved in. According to Charles Allen, who was hidden because he is a protected federal witness, there was a lot of potential for profit in Local 54. Well, say 10 years ago, Atlantic City was dying. 
Nobody wanted Local 54. Now, all of a sudden, Atlantic City came. Everybody wants Local 54 because of the gambling. When the committee turned to their final witness of the day, according to officials, the reputed Atlantic City organized crime boss, Nicodemo Scarfo, no answers were to be had. To all questions of his own involvement in organized labor in New Jersey, Scarfo refused to answer on the Fifth Amendment grounds of self-incrimination. The hearings are expected to continue so, tomorrow. after we get the news that Frank is out, my uncle is furious. He's full of venom against Joe Salerno. Do you believe this motherfucker? Can you believe what he just did? We can't let this stand. He's as good as dead. His whole fucking lineage is as good as fucking dead. Nikki Scarfo was a volatile, homicidal maniac on a good day. But the climate around him in the summer months of 1982 made him an untamed beast whose penchant for blood and violence had reached an all-time high. As if the murder of his trusted consigliere, Frank Monti, and the war with Harry Riccobini weren't enough, Scarfo had just lost control of the biggest union in Atlantic City and the riches that came with it, which amounted to nearly a million dollars per year, tax-free, cash, and the unbridled power that came from controlling a union with thousands of members. Add to that the two-year federal prison sentence that was hanging over his head on the 1979 weapon charge and Nicodemo Scarfo wasn't exactly in what you would call a good place. Plus, his allergies were acting up. My uncle's allergies were real bad. And when they were bothering him, forget about it. He was the most miserable human being on the planet. Everybody would stay away. That's how bad he was. Now, around this time, we had our hands full and my uncle was unfucking bearable. The worst I had ever seen him. One day he says to me, let's take a walk. And we start walking up Georgia Avenue towards the boardwalk. We're going to meet Salvi and Philip Narducci in front of Convention Hall. As we're walking, my uncle starts telling me a story about the blade, getting drunk in the casino and starting a fight, causing this big scene. I figure He's going to tell me to go to the casino and straighten it all out. Instead, he says to me, This fucking guy is a fucking embarrassment. The way he conducts himself with the drinking and all of this fucking nonsense. I've had it up to here with him. I am done with his shenanigans. I want you to take him for a walk. Down the alleys behind the house. And I want you to kill him. Right there in the alley. Leave him in the gutter where he fucking belongs with all of his drinking. Like the sewer rat that he is. I'm thinking to myself, with everything we've got going on, now we're gonna start killing our own guys? 
what are we doing? After flippantly ordering the murder of Nicholas Nick the Blade Virgilio, one of his oldest friends, Nicky Scarfo was about to cross an even more sinister line with his next murder plot. So now we're on the boardwalk and Salvi and Philip are there waiting for us. Like clockwork, my uncle says to Philip, you seen that cocksucker Joe Salerno around? Not the kid, but I see his old man all the time. He owns a motel down in Wildwood. It was almost like I could see the light bulb go off in my uncle's head. I could read him like a book and I knew what was coming next. Without hesitation, my uncle says to Philip, I want you to go see the old man. And when you do, it's this. And he makes the sign of the gun. We're gonna teach these fucking animals. Okay, Nick. Salvi shoots me a look like, what the fuck is this? This was against the rules and what we were supposed to stand for. Joe Salerno's father was a civilian. He wasn't involved with us or this thing of ours and now we're gonna kill him because of something his son did. I knew this was a big, big fucking mistake. But with my uncle, there's no questioning him. My uncle then turns to Salvi and says to him, everybody connected with our friend, the dwarf. It's this. And he makes the sign of the gun, all of them. His whole fucking regime. You're in charge. Get it done.